Hi, and welcome to the Breastfeeding Medicine Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dr. Ann Eglash. I'm a clinical professor in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and a board-certified lactation consultant. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Karen Bodnar. I am a pediatric hospitalist at Anova Children's Hospital and an assistant professor of pediatrics at Virginia Commonwealth University. I'm also a board-certified lactation consultant. This podcast is produced by the Institute for the Advancement of Breastfeeding and Lactation Education and is co-sponsored by the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Hey, Karen, how are you? I'm okay. How are you? Good. These changing times of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, I think, so our last podcast was about how um, the pandemic is changing our outpatient and inpatient breastfeeding practices, and we talked about policies. And today we have two physicians with us who are from uh, Northern Manhattan and Bronx region. And we're gonna be talking about their strategies, like their programs that they've developed regarding um, hospital follow-up of newborns, particularly the ambulatory care network, um, I believe through the Columbia hospital system. And they will correct me if I am wrong um, about that. Um, And I just want to introduce our two speakers. Um, So Dr. Mina Slasa um, is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Columbia University. And in her newest role is the medical director of the Columbia University New York Presbyterian Hospital's COVID nursery follow-up clinic. In 2008, she joined the Ambulatory Care Network as a general pediatrician taking care of underserved children in the surrounding community, teaching residents and medical students. And Dr. Glassman is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Columbia University and a board certified lactation consultant and the medical director of the New York Presbyterian Hospital Ambulatory Care Network's newborn clinic and the breastfeeding support program at newborn clinic. Dr. Glassman established the newborn clinic in 2009 due to a longstanding need of the hospital to provide timely outpatient follow-up visits for newborns when they're discharged from the well-baby nurseries. Dr. Glassman established the breastfeeding support program at the newborn clinic in 2017 in order to provide intensive hands-on support to breastfeeding diets. So Dr. Glassman, I think we'll start with you. Maybe you could uh, tell us about this um, the uh, Ambulatory Care Network Newborn Clinic, and we'll talk about breastfeeding support as well. Great, thank you, Anne, very much for that introduction. Um, and the, our, our, the name of our hospital system is quite confusing, so you, I think you got it, um, the New York Presbyterian Hospital-Columbia University Irving Medical Center. So that's our very long name for our hospital and Um, academic um, relationship between Columbia and NYP. Um, So today, uh, we're very excited to join you to talk about what we've been doing uh, in Northern Manhattan um, at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And we'll give just a brief overview, just so everybody knows where we practice. Um, So a little bit about our community. Um, Some of the longstanding challenges that we had at securing follow-up at the time of nursery discharge, which ultimately led to the development of the newborn clinic. I want to talk a little bit about the newborn clinic as a model for outpatient newborn care when babies leave the hospital. Um, And then a little about how newborn clinics set the stage for the creation of really a new newborn clinic specifically designed to care for newborns during COVID-19. And uh, Mina will certainly talk more about the nuts and bolts about how uh, we got that clinic up and running and what she does at that at that uh, practice. Um, So in terms of our community overview, uh, New York Presbyterian or NYP Hospital, Columbia, uh, where Newborn Clinic is housed, is a large tertiary care medical center. We are located in Washington Heights, which is an extremely vibrant community in northern Manhattan. Uh, It's an economically disadvantaged community, um, uh, one of the poorest in the city. Um, We are the primary birth center for northern Manhattan and South Bronx at both our children's hospital at the medical center. And then we also have a more community-based hospital called the Allen Hospital, which is about um, 50 to 60 blocks north of us um, at the tip of Manhattan. 
women who deliver at the Children's Hospital, a uh, little bit more of a mixed population with about 30% Medicaid, 60 to 70% commercial insurance. It's where all our high risk OB patients deliver, whether they are um, Medicaid insured or commercially insured. Um, and patients tend to draw from around the city uh, to deliver there. Um, whereas the majority of women who deliver at the Allen Hospital tend to live in the surrounding community in Northern Manhattan and the South Bronx and are primarily Medicaid insured. Um, so the racial ethnic breakdown of our community of about 200,000 people is more than 70% Latino, majority are from the Dominican Republic, 18% white, 7% African American. We have a lot of recent immigrants from all over the world. Uh, English is not the primary language for many of our patients. But one third of our community meets federal poverty guideline standards. And our patient population that we serve in our newborn clinic um, and our clinics overall in the ambulatory care network mirrors the ethnic breakdown of the community. So a little about the challenges that led to the development of Newborn Clinic 11 years ago. Um, historically at the hospital, it was quite difficult to secure follow-up for newborns within the recommended three to five days of life um, at our ACN hospital affiliated clinics. Um, so our ACN, we talk a lot about the ACN and we're very proud of our ACN, is comprised of four outpatient community-based hospital affiliated pediatric clinics and one family medicine practice. Um, the average age of newborns at their first ACN visit historically was somewhere between eight to 11 days, depending on the site. Um, but very often we would have babies coming in at two or three weeks for their first uh, newborn visit after nursery discharge. Um, and you know we, we missed out on that really critical early days in the first week of life in terms of breastfeeding support, feeding, troubleshooting, jaundice, et cetera. You know, additionally, we found that babies were not often linked with their medical home of choice, either within the ACN or with the community provider for a variety of reasons. It could be lack of available appointments, it could be insurance issues. We also have a very high acuity newborn population uh, for both medical and social reasons. So it was a pretty big burden on the discharging nursery providers to ensure secure follow-up for the newborns. Um, and oftentimes it, it was it, you know, very difficult to find that secure follow-up. Um, when it comes to breastfeeding, there are varying, were and are varying levels of breastfeeding support in our community. WIC is certainly our biggest ally, um, but we have a lot of different WIC offices that our patients go to in Northern Manhattan and the Bronx. Um, Queens, you know, we, we do have patients coming from all over. Um, so it's hard for us to know what level of support they receive at the particular WIC site, whether there's an IBCLC on site or, you know, or et cetera. Um, and really there were no private lactation consultants in our local community to meet with patients once they'd left the hospital setting. So that's kind of where Newborn Clinic came into play. Um, Newborn Clinic um, was developed as a, as a really kind of a novel model uh, to provide the first outpatient visit after well baby nursery discharge. NICU has its own workflow follow-ups. But after well baby nursery discharge within three to five days of life, specifically for newborns with Medicaid insurance or who are uninsured. These were the babies who were having the hardest time linking with the secure medical home early on after discharge. Um, and in particular for babies who had no secure medical home or they planned on coming to one of our ACN sites. And our four goals were really, one, to identify and manage medical issues unique to the neonatal period. So things like weight loss, um, uh, Billy Rubin and jaundice, um, two, to provide breastfeeding support, three, to provide educational or education and psychosocial support and services, and then our fourth big, fourth big goal was to help newborns establish their medical home. So we're located physically at our medical center. Uh, we are a small operation. We're staffed by myself um, and a nurse practitioner. We have an on-site social worker. And as of three years ago, we were able to finally hire uh, a dedicated lactation consultant. So we have a registered dietitian who is also an IBCLC uh, on site. We see about 50 to 60 newborns a week. Due to space constraints, we operate only in the morning, so five mornings a week. Um, and we have about 2,000 visits a year. So now in our 11th year, we've cared for well over 20,000 newborns. Um, we do have and do use the translator services frequently. We use the telephonic translator, uh, mostly for Spanish. Um, over the years, uh, we certainly have picked up a lot of Spanish, and um, but for those visits that are more complicated and um, depending on the provider's ability, we will use the translator services. And we have patients that come from around the world. So certainly we need to access more than um, 
just English and Spanish. Um, we have had the good fortune, though, of hiring um, a bilingual fluent English and Spanish IBCLC, which has been um, extremely helpful. Um, just by nature of what the visit is like and how intense the visit can be when you're working with breastfeeding dyads, it's been extremely helpful to um, have a bilingual fluent uh, lactation consultant. We do a focused and comprehensive newborn visit. We do weights and measurements on every baby uh, and every baby gets a transcutaneous bilirubin check as well. Um, we do significant amount of pre-rounding, so we ensure that all medical issues that are identified during the pregnancy and the nursery stay are followed. Um, and this is definitely a benefit to myself and the NP. We're outpatient. We, we know who's coming to see us. All the babies who see us um, were born at our hospital, either the Allen or the Children's Hospital, so we have the benefit of a full medical record. And the majority of the women have had their prenatal care with us as well, so we can also scan the prenatal charts. Um, every baby who um, leaves the newborn clinic leaves with an appointment in hand for their subsequent pediatric visit. And this was a, a really key part of the newborn clinic. Um, we have a community provider list that we've developed and we continually update for parents to look at to select a pediatrician, either in the community or one, at, one of our outlying uh, ACN sites. And our staff makes those follow-up appointments, verifies the insurance, and makes sure that the practice can, can actually see the baby in the appropriate amount of uh, time. We have a fair number of high-risk newborns that follow up with us. So if we can't secure a follow-up at their community office um, in the appropriate amount of time, we will have them come back to us. It's a small number. Um, we are not um, just space and capacity-wise equipped to be able to take on a, a large number of these follow-ups. But for babies who need a bilirubin done within the next 24 hours, in particular for our breastfeeding dyads who have significant issues or significant weight loss, we would rather them come back to us where we can support them and kind of get them over the hump as opposed to sending them out where they may not be able to get a rapid turnaround on blood work or have a provider that maybe gives the same hands-on support with breastfeeding that our lactation consultant could do. Um, we, uh, another kind of key component, this is a safety net practice, and then the key component is that we do follow up on all our no-shows. So we have a very low no-show rate, and anybody who does not come for their visit gets um, hounded by uh, our nurse practitioner until we get in touch with them and either get them to come back to us or ensure that they have a, a secure link with a medical home in the community. Um, Overall, it has been a very successful model at our hospital. We have established a new standard of care here and really provided a mechanism for the hospitals and our colleagues in the nurseries to safely discharge newborns and provide them with a secure follow-up with us. Um, we've reduced the average age of the first visit down to five days of life. Um, we ensure that secure linkage with the medical home. Um, we make sure that if a patient is going to a community provider, they get a printed medical summary to bring with them. Um, our social worker is a key member of our team and links patients with a variety of community resources, you know, women's postpartum depression support groups, mental health resources, and other variety of um, linkages that she and we have maintained over the years. Um, we have a really unique position. We're kind of in between inpatient and outpatient, and it allows us to, to kind of have a broad overview of what's happening in the nursery, um, and also to see you know, trends that are coming up through prenatal care or the inpatient stay that we can then go back and discuss with our colleagues, both good and bad. I would say a recent thing that we dealt with were um, a lot of moms uh, not getting um, electric breast pumps, which are covered by Medicaid. Um, so we worked closely with our OB colleagues. We worked with some local pharmacies that would accept pretty much all the insurance plans that we see um, and to come up with a better workflow um, to enable women to, uh, if needed, even get delivery directly to the inpatient side before the mom goes home if they need an a, a, a electric pump. Um, I just want to touch on some of the breastfeeding support we do in newborn clinic. Um, I think probably the... Can I just ask a question before yeah, you launch it? Yeah. So just a question. So then when this, when you started the newborn clinic, do you feel like there was some opposition by community physicians feeling that some of the care would be taken away from them and that they would yeah. perhaps not have as sharp of acumen when it comes to taking care of hyperbilly postpartum or mm -hmm. worrying about like that they won't be able to continue developing their breastfeeding support skills? Sure, it's a great question. You know, when we were very aware of that and very worried about that when we first started. So 
we hosted meetings with some of our um, we had community liaisons through the hospital that worked with community practices. We hosted meetings and dinners just so that they knew who we were. And um, and in fact, one of you know kind of the fifth goal was we were trying to get as many babies to community providers as possible. You know, we have um, a pretty large NICU. We have a lot of extremely high risk babies that really should stay in our practices who are being mm -hmm. followed by multiple subspecialists. So I some you know we at times feel that our clinics better serve the most high risk complex babies if only that we have a direct link to our subspecialist so for these healthy newborns where the mom's not quite sure where she wants to bring her baby we try to get them to to look at one of you know the very rich you know number of um uh, pediat pediatricians and community physicians in the surrounding area. Um, so I think that it was a lot of outreach and just letting providers know that we know we are not doing this because we want more patients in our practices. In fact, we're trying to offload some um, because we're already super busy. Um, and I think it just took time, you know, for the providers to see that we were absolutely referring out. Um, right. Right. And, and I think I have so, a follow up. Yeah, please question also which is do you have residents in the newborn follow-up clinic yeah so um one of the um uh, i think a huge learning piece with this is that the residents do rotate through us um, and so what i was going to say about the other concerns when we started this was actually that the residents in our practices might not see as many newborns or be able to manage some of these really important things that they need to learn how to manage um, the the only thing was we weren't taking it away they they still weren't seeing it because the babies were waiting a few weeks you know and it was kind of done at that point by the time they showed up at two or three weeks in the practice so kind of to get around that i think the, the residents do get that experience when they rotate through with us um all interns spend a little bit of time i wish we could spend more time um they have pretty busy schedule, um, but they will on their ambulatory block spend some time with us. And then I also offer a newborn clinic elective and a breastfeeding elective. So it's some of the only time that our residents get to see outpatient breastfeeding support and what that looks like. Um, so that's been actually another huge success of this um, model. I've also wondered if, um, if this is a way for you to have a little bit of influence over um, who over, um, or putting some, like a little leverage over the, regarding the knowledge that physicians in the community should have regarding breastfeeding. And I particularly thought about this when I've talked to um, one of the physicians who runs at a Monarch, who um, works at the Monarch Clinic in Ontario, where it's a mm -hmm. similar model in Ontario, um, in Ottawa, Ontario. Yeah. And what they do is a very similar thing where the newborns are leaving after the newborns are leaving after 24 hours, they go to the Monarch Clinic, but they actually stay in that clinic for a number of days or weeks until they're actually doing well and then they're sent off to their primary physician. And I've often wondered if they have some control over who is more likely to get newborns if they're mm -hmm. breastfeeding supportive. And if they're not very breastfeeding supportive, perhaps yeah. they would not be on that list or maybe not highly, you know, placed on that list. Right. You know, I don't know if that has, has crossed your mind at all or if patients sometimes ask, well, who will really help me with breastfeeding? And particularly yeah. if you have someone who has like insufficient glandular tissue or you know you need someone who's going to watch breastfeeding very, very closely. Right. So I think that it's it happened kind of naturally. Like we see which providers, you know, sometimes former residents who rotated through with us and then go on to join a local practice. And we tend to say, you know what, you don't know where you want to, you know, to a parent, you don't know where you want to go, but this doctor is right near you. And actually she's great with breastfeeding. So I think mm -hmm. we have that but it's very few and far between. It's a pretty big list. I mean, there's, I mean, how many, 75 or 80 providers that are on this list. So unfortunately, it's not like this very tight group that we can say, you know, aside from, like I said, the former residents or people that have, you know, over, over the years kind of reached back out to us. Um, I would say that comes into play very much so, though, in terms of how we hone our list with um, practices that we've seen um, have turned our patients away because they didn't have their Medicaid card, you know, before mm. 30 days. So we definitely do a lot of honing of the list for under that, for that, um, not with breastfeeding, 
but for some of the medical things or high risk babies that you know weren't seen when they were supposed to or the office isn't open in a good amount of time you know that's not a place that we should send a high risk baby right um, I think the beauty of now that we have a lactation consultant and, and I, I you know really briefly talk a little bit about what we do for breastfeeding support but the ability to now use telelactation so she meets with all of our breastfeeding dyads who have questions concerns anything beyond what we're going to cover during our newborn clinic visit um, she will meet immediately they she swoops into the room and takes over um, and then now with telelactation in particular for follow-ups has been very successful because she's already met them she's worked with them one-on-one -on -one, and it's a really easy link to just then kind of follow up with them as needed mm -hmm. um, and patients certainly can reach back out to schedule more um, you know more either inpatient in, in sorry in person or additional telelactation oh that's great yeah Okay. Yeah. So you can talk a little bit more about that aspect of your program. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, the one thing that I do want to mention um, was that we were not developed as a breastfeeding support practice at all. I mean, 11 years ago, breastfeeding was on our minds, but not necessarily on the hospital, you know, kind of agenda. And it grew really out of AAP guidelines and joint commission guidelines that we need to make sure we're seeing these babies for, you know, for hyperbilly rubinemia and for jaundice and for you know, a whole host of issues that happen in the first week, but we didn't develop as a breastfeeding support practice. And I, and I mentioned that only because I think um, we were so desperate to get breastfeeding support formally off the ground 11 years ago, um, but it wasn't the right time to be pushing that um, as we were trying to get it off the ground. But once we had our foot in the door, um, we we're perfect, clearly perfectly poised for breastfeeding support at that visit. And it kind of, again, with our pushing and a lot of work on, you know, on, on my part, pushing for it, but it, it happened um, downstream or down the line. And I just offer that up because I think that in particular, if you're passionate about breastfeeding support and really desperately trying to get something to start, it, it may not start immediately, but you know that you get the foot in the door and then, you know, it, it will come. Um, like anything, you know, you always start small when you have some hidden goals, you know, in your back pocket. Yes. Exactly. You, you share later. Yeah. So both myself and the, the nurse practitioner uh, in newborn clinic, we're both IBCLCs. We both feel very passionate about breastfeeding support. Every visit has breastfeeding support worked into it. But as any clinician knows, it's very hard to do everything in particular in a busy practice when everybody seems to show up all at the same five minute, you know, registration time. Um, so having that dedicated LC has been huge for us um, as providers and certainly for our patients as well. Um, so what she is able to do is meet with the dyads doing, during the newborn clinic session. Um, because of the way our, our day is kind of structured, she has afternoons for follow-ups um, of patients that she has seen in the morning, you know, on, on sessions past, and then also to take referrals from the nursery. Perhaps the baby went directly to their community provider, um, but needs that um, uh, an IBCLC visit. So the nurseries, our NICUs, our community providers, some of our private offices that um, uh, faculty practices as well, all, all know how to refer patients directly to our lactation consultant. And we had actually spearheaded an effort last June um, when we were seeing a lot of no-shows for some of our in-person lactation visits. Um, and we said, let's try some telelactation and see if that helps with no-shows. And so we were already doing um, a pretty, you know, large-scale effort to do telelactation um, for our referrals, and it certainly has transitioned very nicely into the extremely large effort that we're doing now, and in most places we're doing now with um, telemedicine. Um, so that's kind of newborn clinic in a nutshell, and I would say we were happily plugging along, doing. What Listen, we we're, we're kind of losing you a little bit, voice-wise. Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, so that that is that's basically newborn clinic. In a, in a brief nutshell. And I would say that we were plugging along, doing our thing. Um, and then the world turned upside down about four weeks ago um, with COVID. And, you know, there was never a question at our institution whether a newborn clinic would be turned into a telemedicine practice, um, while other practices in our outlying sites are really scaling down on the older visit, you know, the older children's visits. Of course, they um, are prioritizing the younger children for vaccines and well child visits. And newborn clinic, um, it was never a thought that we should transform newborn visits into telemedicine. And it certainly has 
uh, borne out that we're seeing um, a lot of feeding issues, a lot of um, jaundice, much more than before, only because the babies are now going home much sooner than, than before. So moms are being discharged from a vaginal delivery at less than 24 hours, the C-section's less than 48 hours, everybody wants to go home, not surprisingly. Um, so we are seeing them, we have prioritized that, and we are still seeing um, all of our newborns in, in person, um, in newborn clinic. But as the number of COVID positive moms began to increase inpatient at the time of delivery, we needed and really seemingly overnight to develop a newborn clinic that could take care of the um, PUI babies. So the babies born to COVID positive moms, we could not uh, figure out a safe way to incorporate those patients into our newborn clinic. We couldn't have them you know, in the same site um, as our healthy newborns. Um, so we really had to develop another parallel clinic. And, and based on everything we do in newborn clinic and know about developing and getting it up and running, um, it, it really enabled us to transition and pivot and develop our COVID nursery follow-up clinic. So I'm gonna turn it over now to, um, to Mina. Can I just ask a question before we talk about that? Um, so I've noticed some changes in my community regarding the early discharge. Um, I had one mother, for example, who said that at the time of discharge, she was told by her pediatrician to um, consider just um, having some formula like not, don't plan on coming in for so many weight checks for the newborn, just mm. if your baby seems, seems hungry after breastfeeding, just give some formula and then we don't have to worry about weight checks. Mm. And so I'm not sure, I wonder, do you have a sense that the newborn hospitalists or whoever's taking care of the babies in the hospital before they leave um, are nervous about um, weight checks and are trying to, and are advising something like that? So, I mean, Mina can definitely pipe in and, sh you know, in terms of what she's been seeing, I am, I am not seeing, I'm not seeing anything or hearing anything otherwise from our patients or my patients that I'm seeing in newborn clinic. I do think that my colleagues and I are more concerned in particular when they're discharging the baby at 18 hours of life, you know, about that. Um, and I think that not, I, so I have not heard, you know, top off with a little formula, but I've definitely heard, um, you know, I'm telling my patients now, you know, whereas maybe before we used to say feed at least every three hours, now it's feed at least every two hours, you know, so I think there's a certainly more awareness and a push to um, get those babies feeding more frequently. But right. I haven't, I have not experienced the, you know, well, they told me I should, you know, take some formula. So there was, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, Trish McEnroe, who's the executive saw, director, yeah, yeah, Baby Friendly, do you want to talk about that? No, no, go ahead. Yeah, oh, I saw okay. that you had sent it, so yeah, please, go ahead. Yeah, so she um, recently wrote a piece, I think, on her website regarding the Baby Friendly USA recommendations for Baby Friendly Hospitals, that they're lifting the restrictions on giving uh, formula samples to families that are using formula before they leave the hospital. And that's something that, that, that was, you know, considered to be um, not, you know, kosher um, yeah. for um, baby friendly hospitals. But then apparently the formula companies have actually really um, responded to that, to that saying, well, we can help, we can help, we can give you more formula, we can provide formula, just give us the names of the families who are leaving and we'll send them through formula. And so they've sort yeah. of been hounding hospitals, I guess, regarding this. Wow. And that's why she came out with a statement. That's interesting because last week I started having families asking in the hospital, I mean, not just for formula, they were also asking, can we take more diapers? The stores are empty. We're worried we're not going to be able to get some. And we're saying, you know, we can't, like, we have to have them for our patients. We can't give everybody extras. They're going to be in the stores, calm down. Um, but I definitely think that there are some individuals who are responding by giving extra formula to people who, and I don't, my hospital is not baby friendly, so mm -hmm. it's fairly liberal to begin with. Yeah, I think that there are some reports from families that they're having difficulty finding formula in some communities who do use formula for supplementation or for all feedings. I heard this from WIC. Um, from oh, the, it's true here. There yeah, have been open. stores that did not have it. Yeah. So I don't know if it's hoarding or it's a manufacturing issue, 
I'm not. No, sure. it's hoarding. Oh, it's hoarding. It's totally hoarding. Yeah. And <laughs> so if the formula hoarding. companies are looking for names of people to mail formula to, then it probably is hoarding because they must have plenty of it. So, okay. So, yeah, um, Mina, Dr. Mina Slasa. Hi. Um, so, Hi. thank you for having me. Um, yeah, this was sort of a whirlwind um, clinic creation, I have to say. Um, so, um, I'll talk a little bit about sort of the creation of the clinic and then some of our goals and the structure and um, a little bit about the patients that we're seeing as well. Um, so on March 23rd, uh, the hospital was announcing that they were going to start universal testing of all women who were entering labor and delivery. And so the weekend before that, um, we basically created this clinic. Um, like Dr. Glassman said, uh, we needed some place where we could safely see these babies uh, and, and, and try to uh, mitigate any kind of um, spreading of, of infectious diseases um, amongst our healthy patients as well. And so um, <clears throat> the first week we, uh, through departmental support, we got some space, we got some staff from other departments. Uh, we borrowed some supplies from newborn clinic uh, while we were waiting for our supplies to come in and we just kind of started to figure it out. And um, we had decided that our, our main goal was similar to newborn clinic to, to br be a bridge to the medical home, especially for the first 14 days when these babies were being considered um, persons under investigation. And um, also to provide safe follow-up after hospital discharge so that our hospitalists didn't have to tell parents, oh, just feed formula, um, because they were worried that the babies couldn't be seen by a private pediatrician in the community for weight checks um, so frequently. And so um, as far as bridging to the medical home, I think one of the things I just want to mention is that the list that Melissa's clinic uses uh, for the community pediatricians, it's about almost three pages long. Um, and we had one of our staff members call the, the clinics to see which ones would um, be able to see, see our babies who were PUIs, if they had enough PPE on hand and uh, if they were equipped or even open to see them. And the, the list shriveled to, down to about half a page. So, um, so access for these babies in the community was really um, pretty dismal. And so we, um, we started the week with four patients and then soon found that we needed to see about 15 patients the following week. And so we added another physician to our group and we're um, able to see babies now um, in person four days a week. And what our model is, is sort of a dual visit model. So the mothers, because they are in, technically in quarantine, they're not able to physically come to the visit with the infant. So we arrange for a telehealth visit the day before, and we've set aside a full hour for this. And um, we do a televisit with the mother, we answer her questions, we do give breastfeeding support. And um, if we feel like the mother needs further breastfeeding support, then um, Melissa has kindly allowed us to um, utilize uh, her, her lactation consultant in the newborn clinic. And so we've started referring um, to her as well. And um, it, it gives us a chance to set rapport with the mother, kind of understand her concerns, and also see the baby the day before just to make sure that there aren't any um, other medical issues that we need to address before the in-person visit. The in-person visit then occurs on the next day, and um, it's in our hospital clinic where we have set aside also an hour for each patient so that we don't have overlap of patients, again, to try to decrease um, any chance that there could be um, infection from, from um, the other patients that we're seeing. And the babies will come with another family member who's well. We do a physical exam and we check uh, TCB and serum bully if we need to and um, uh, check the weight and head circumference and then give some brief anticipatory guidance and answer uh, questions that might have come up since uh, the telehealth visit. We also confirm that they have uh, made the appointment with their pediatrician for the two week or further checkup. And we remain available for them in the first two weeks if they have questions. And also if they need any kind of uh, more um, 
more acute follow-up for our weight check or ability check before the 14-day um, monitoring incubation period um, ends. Um, I have to say that uh, the success of this project also really um, has depended on a separate team that the hospital has provided for us, which is a, a, a group of folks who have done outreach to the families to connect them to our MyChart apps. So the telehealth visits happen through the um, patient portal and the app is downloaded onto a smartphone and we have a team of people working with labor and delivery as well as in the newborn nursery to make sure that the mothers and the babies have the app up and running so that we're able to do the telehealth visits in a seamless way. Um, we realized very quickly in the first week that it really was impossible for the providers on the Well Baby Nursery Service or in the NICU. Um, we also are seeing some of the NICU babies um, for them to, to really be able to assure that the parents would be able to, to do the technology part of this as well. So um, we've been really lucky that the hospital has given us further support to have a team working on this. Um, and do then you as, sense, do you uh -huh. have a sense of like what percent of the babies that are PUIs are um, actually coming to you versus somehow wandering around the community looking for a physician to see them postpartum? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things that we're still looking at, and there is a group of people actually um, putting together some research on where all the babies have gone and, and the outcomes. So um, I, I can't tell you exactly, but I feel like we're seeing a fair amount of them. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're, I think this week we're crossing sort of the 50 mark as far as how many babies we've seen. So, and then are you, are you be testing them for COVID-19? So um, that still remains to be seen because at, uh, initially we didn't have enough swabs to really be uh, testing asymptomatic babies. So we were just swabbing them in the nursery. Um, but I, there's been some talk about possibly doing some surveillance um, in, in future clinics. So um, sort of to be determined. Right, right. And then, oh, I have another question. So when the, when the caretakers bring the babies to the clinic, obviously they're taking care of the babies and these babies are possibly infected. We don't know for sure. Right. And um, so do these people, do they express concern for their own health? Like whether, like, do they have PPE? What are they wearing when they come in to see you? Yeah, so, um, so great question. So one of the things that we tried to anticipate was to try to protect the people bringing the baby as well um, before the baby is discharged. And so um, we have asked the Well Baby Nursery team to give the family extra masks so that whoever brings the baby um, can have their own mask. At this mm -hmm. point, they're giving masks for everyone who um, enters the hospital, so it's not as much of an issue as in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, in the telehealth visits, we're also able to figure out who's in the home, assess, you know, a lot of people live with grandparents or people who are over 60 who are in a higher risk group. And so we're able to do some counseling about, um, you know, being careful around those family members as well. Right, right. Yeah, great. That kind of brings up a question that I had listening to you, which is, I heard that a lot or a fair number of mothers who are delivering are asymptomatic. And, you know, once they started doing universal testing of the moms who are coming to deliver, they discovered there was a, a fair percentage of study. I saw, saw, you know, I know we don't want to get into numbers too much, but it's over 10%. And so my question is, since I know from what Melissa told me, those moms are doing direct breastfeeding in the hospital, and when they get home, if that mom was asymptomatic and she tested positive, I'm not sure exactly how they determine when she is considered no longer contagious. And so if she is in contact with that baby, they could get infected at five days of life or seven days of life. And so their period that they should be observed is, is actually more than two weeks. It's the mom's time that she's contagious plus the, the two weeks from if the baby got it the last day the mom was contagious. Does that make sense? Yeah, so um, this has also been sort of a question that we have been asking 
I would say pretty much on a weekly basis because I feel like the guidelines change. And so, you know, I almost feel like if I, whatever I say today may change tomorrow. Um, but basically right now what we're doing is that the babies are under observation for the 14 day incubation period, like anyone would be if they were exposed. Um, and um, the moms who we know are COVID positive, their, um, their status starts from the date that they were tested. And so the, I, the guidance that we've received so far is that if the parent has been um, asymptomatic for seven days after being tested, that that would be sort of the time where um, they would no longer be considered in quarantine. But absolutely, you know, the babies have to be monitored for those 14 days. And if they become symptomatic, then the baby gets quarantined again. <laughs> Does that make sense? Well, that's, that's a question. That's, a, that's such an interesting issue because first we don't know positively if someone had it, if they are totally immune, although they are saying probably, right? So then if the mother is, and this is what we do too at the University of Wisconsin, if someone from the time that they're diagnosed to seven days, they're clear unless and they have to be without symptoms, like severe coughing, like, right. they, like uncontrolled right. symptoms for 72 hours. So if she has it, if she is now seven days after the diagnosis and she still doesn't have symptoms, it seems that she should be able to take full responsibility for the baby, get everyone else out of the picture because she's immune and, um, and let her be the one to take care of the baby without a mask because she doesn't have to anymore. Right. Would that that's, make sense? That's, that's my understanding right now that after seven days, the mask can come off for the mom, but, yeah. the, but the baby still remains a PUI. So the baby still has access issues for the first two weeks because there are some practices that won't see the babies. When oh babies. yeah. In terms of right, in terms of yeah. um, being right, infect, right. infectious, infectious to others, right. but then the mom should be the one, the, the full caretaker and no one else care, caretake for the baby at that point. Heaven forbid she has twins. Right. <laughs> right. So is your question whether um, at that point she would be the person accompanying the baby to the clinic? Right. right. No, no, that, I mean, yes, that, that's helpful, but it was more having to do with if she, you know, is really the one of, you know, even if she's wearing a mask, she could still infect her baby at five days postpartum. And so sort of, if that baby gets infected at five days postpartum and isn't symptomatic, how long is that baby a risk to their community pediatrician who doesn't have enough PPE? Yeah, so I don't think anyone knows the answer to that, right? No, and that's sort of the, the challenging thing is we have such limited information and trying to figure out how long to keep them. And, you know, I think Anne has a really good point that once that mom, if she really was positive and was sick, she gets better. I mean, not only is she protecting her baby with her breast milk, but also she can protect the baby from the husband or the sibling who also got it later and is still infectious and living in the same house. We're seeing a ton of people where I am where low families with, you know, low income live in very crowded conditions and a family of six, every person got it. Yeah, I think we have to just assume that everyone has it. I think that's sort of the assumption that most people are going by. Um, and so, you know, we have to do our best with with guidelines that we're being given, I think, at this point. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's kind of funny because if you think about, like I think about years ago, like chicken pox. And um, so we didn't start the vaccine until 1995. But before that, you know, as a family doctor, we just assumed, you know, one person gets it. We just assume either anyone who didn't get it is immune period. Like you have to get it if you have someone in the house of chicken pox. And, um, and, it's, and it's funny how we think that we can kind of have one person in the house with, co with this coronavirus and no one else is going to, you can actually prevent exposure to anyone else. If you follow the rule of chicken pox, it's just not gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, so I think that um, the, so just going back a little bit, so one of the, uh, just with our model, one of the goals is to see the babies before, of course, they turn to uh, one week old. So that's part of it. 
Um, we're averaging somewhere around day of life, five or six for our visits. Some are coming sooner, some are coming a little bit later. And um, I think that the nice thing that I'm seeing though is that many of these women are breastfeeding. If they're either pumping and then feeding breast milk from a bottle or they're breastfeeding directly. And um, I haven't gotten the sense that anyone has been told not to do that. And it, I feel that everyone has gotten the, uh, as close to it as what we can give to anticipatory guidance um, to minimize transmission of COVID to the, to the infant um, you know, guidelines. So um, I think most of them, they're, you know, they're wearing masks, they're being careful to distance themselves from the babies when they're not breastfeeding. Um, they're washing their hands and doing hand hygiene and breast hygiene. And so um, I feel like many of these moms are, um, are being successful, at least in, if not completely breastfeeding, then at least partially breastfeeding. Do you think that these babies, that after they see you, um, you know, do you think that you had mentioned that the list of um, providers, physicians that will see these babies is pretty small. Are you having difficulty getting them in to see someone for another visit, for another weight check? So um, if it's within the 14 day period, yes. And so that's why we exist, because then we can take care of these acute issues. Um, and uh, after the 14 day period, it's really just variable. But I, I'm finding that most of the patients are going to our um, our sort of community academic practice that we have, I think, um, because of the access issues in the community. So you're basically seeing them more than once. Like if you have someone who is like seriously at risk for not like a delay in lactation or something like that, where, where they need to be weighed the next day, you'll see them back the next day for another weight check? Yeah, so um, as so we we are seeing patients four days a week. So Mondays are the only days when we don't have a clinic operating, but the other days we could see them back. Um, we're we've been very careful with these COVID positive um, moms and babies, that, and the Well Baby Nursery is being more conservative in that they're really monitoring them more in the inpatient setting before they discharge them, uh, so that we don't have to um, sort of scramble. To, to make sure that these babies have safe follow-up. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I would say that for us, everybody wants to leave the hospital sooner, but the, um, the positives might actually stay longer because the follow-up is more challenging. And also we have been keeping babies in general and treating more aggressively for um, early jaundice. So somebody who's borderline who maybe would not have gotten treated, we might go ahead and treat rather than having them have to get labs drawn multiple times the rest of the week. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, something, I, I'm seeing something similar here too. Although I don't feel like the discharges are being delayed by too much, but, but definitely there's an awareness that, um, that, you know, someone that you might've discharged sooner, you know, two months ago um, is, is being observed at least later into the day. Mm -hmm. how, how reasonable it is to consider um, providing like inexpensive scales for intermittent weight checks in northern Manhattan, Bronx region? Um, I really don't know the answer to that. Um, I think uh, for the numbers of babies that we have, I think it would be hard to get that many scales out. Um, mm -hmm. well, I guess I was thinking in terms of returning, like getting return, getting them back to the clinic just because, you know, transportation is just tougher and more expensive where you are, whereas here people just jump in their car, drop it off. Um, so we've been, some of the pediatricians here are giving out scales and asking people to return them once weights are stable. I see. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that we would have a place to keep that many scales, but it's a thought um, right now. Many of our patients do live close to the hospital, and so um, I don't see any difficulty from that for them to come in. Um, so I think that the and I have to say, like we haven't. I think we've maybe scheduled two or three babies, honestly, to come back for a weight check. So it doesn't seem to be that um, that much of an urgent issue in this group of of babies. I'm not sure. Is, is Maybe it's because they are being discharged a little bit more carefully. 
Right, right. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, anything else to share? Um, I, I just, I, I want to say that the tele, um, telehealth visits have been really great. Um, at, it, they've been a chance to really give some good anticipatory guidance points for general pediatric sort of safety points. Um, we're seeing the babies in their cribs, we're seeing them in their homes. And um, so we're able to support the, the parents' good decisions about how they're maybe placing the baby to sleep or how their crib is set up. Um, and uh, it's been nice to see sort of the baby in, in his or her own environment. So it's, it's been nice. And would you say that you, um, do you think that, or I guess, what's your opinion about the universal screening for all of these uh, mothers? Do you think that this um, is a reasonable thing to continue to do? Well, I, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist, so, um, I, you know, I'm sure that there are some good reasons to do it from a public health perspective, um, but I think that there's also the importance of keeping our staff and other patients safe. So um, I don't see a downside to doing it. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the other thing would, that will be, I guess, for informational purposes, we'll know what outcomes will be. We'll have a better sense of the number of people who are asymptomatic who actually go on to never having symptoms, especially in these age groups. Mm -hmm. And also the converse, right? Um, looking at risk factors for those who, who have more severe symptoms. Right, right. Great. Well, this was really informative. Um, and um, it's, I think this is a great model. I think that the idea of having a safety net newborn clinic is amazing. And I think I'm surprised that other communities have not done this. I know that some people, there are a few other places, like I know there's one physician, Dr. Nan Dahlquist in Oregon, who does all of the newborn care for her, her large pediatric group, and basically does something like the Monarch Clinic, where she sort of has, she follows them until they're doing fine breastfeeding wise, and then sending them off to their pediatricians by their two month exam. Yeah, we have a very um, similar model where I trained at University of Florida, Go Gators, um, that we had the, the newborns all follow up with a nurse practitioner, IBCLC, that was sort of within the continuity clinic and our residents rotated there, which was wonderful. Where I am now, they have sort of also peeled out the newborns, but they've done it into an area where the residents barely go. And so I feel like they have had that deficit in their education as a result. And I just want to say, Melissa, it was so fun to learn more about it because over the years I've heard you talk a little bit about it as it has grown. And this is really helpful. Good. Interesting. Excellent. I, yeah. I love talking about newborn clinic. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And uh, we might, uh, con Karen and I may contact you for updates on how things are going with these babies that you're following and uh, especially the COVID positives. And um, yeah, just uh, seeing how, I think it'll be really interesting for all of us to see how we transition out of this whole pandemic situation with healthcare. Yeah. Good job taking care of them, Mina. Yes, yes, you guys are, yep. you guys are here. For, for everyone for taking care of their patients as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, well, take care and uh, it's great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Stay well. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. For questions regarding this podcast, please contact us through our website at lacted.org. -E we have other educational projects, including the clinical question of the week, our little green book of breastfeeding management for physicians, and our various educational courses and conferences for physicians and other breastfeeding supporters. If you want to see what we look like, check out our Breastfeeding Medicine podcast Facebook page, where you can post any questions or comments about our podcasts. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back with you in about four weeks.